Welcome, guys, to another episode of Consciously Curious, where we deep dive with those that are thriving in their passion. Um, on today's episode, we're at ESQ Clothing with Ga Wang, home of the handmade, truly bespoke garments. We're at 555 West Jackson, but in a couple months, we'll be at 180 North LaSalle. Yep. yep. So please check them out if you're looking for, for garments that actually like truly fit you. In a way. That's the plan. And it's yeah. all handmade. Yes, all handmade. So, Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, can we start with, you, you had a pivot in your life. A little bit. Right? So, growing growing up, what was the trajectory um, of your life, of your career path? I mean, you, you know this probably better than most. Growing up as an Asian kid here in the States with immigrant parents, I mean, the career path was lawyer, doctor engineer that right was, that's kind of it right right, right. um and i come from a family where my, my father has his own law practice as well so okay. so i kind of grew up with that uh, luckily my mom uh, maybe i think when i was around 10 years old my mother was kind of tired of my dad being the breadwinner mm. and she just became became an entrepreneur. Okay. And she started her own business. Um, and she's doing very, very well. She's in the import export business. So okay. I kind of, even though my dad has his long, my father has his own law practice, it's kind of, um, I kind of come from an entrepreneurial background. Yeah. Uh, in certain Was regards. Was it textiles or something completely? No, something okay, completely okay. different. Yeah. She's okay. in, she's in auto parts, which is oh. super random. Yeah. Um, and she couldn't, she couldn't change her change the oil in a car, like, <laughs> which is really funny. But um, and so from that kind of spirit, I never really thought. I mean, I I started. I went to law school and then mm -hmm. passed the bar and did all that, thinking that I was going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and after practicing for about a year or so, I realized that really wasn't my passion. Mm -hmm. um, I really put a little bit more time and energy into thinking about just, Hey, what would I wear going to work? And from then I had some suits made for myself and it kind of just snowballed from there. And, 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 I, and I got to the point where I was like, Hey, why don't I wasn't happy with, I really wasn't thrilled with what I was able to get. So thinking, how do I make something better just with my connections and whatnot? Um, and, and really, it's been a long journey and it continues to be a deep dive of learning as much as possible. I think mm -hmm. there's a continual learning process. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's ever anyone who's like, I'm an expert at something. Well, when you stop learning, what's the point? Right. Uh, so right now, I mean, I, I've visited about 180 factories around the world um, from I Asia to Italy to mm -hmm. England, just to kind of see what's out there, what people can make, uh, the difference in quality, all the little things, um, and how to create a better product. And, and that's kind of what it, uh, in my mind, that's kind of what it takes. It's mm -hmm. not just saying like, Hey, we can, it's kind of not like w we want to create the same thing that's already out there. We want to create a better product. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is year seven of esq now okay going yeah. on going on yeah. going on year eight and it's uh it's been exciting it's been a journey um i i, I will say my parents have and, and everyone around me has been very supportive throughout uh doesn't doesn't mean they weren't um I didn't get a super positive reaction when I told them I was going to make the switch from. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, here we are, and um, yeah, we're we're excited about the new location. We're right, right. we're very excited about that move. Um, it'll just be a little bit closer to our clientele. Okay. And, um, it's going to be a little bit different space. It's going to be a little bit more modern of a space, but it's. Gonna I be, thought this was my. I was like, okay, yeah, all right. It's 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 going to be really nice. Okay. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, growing up, did you have a knack for design, an eye for design, and patterns and clothing or anything like not, that? Or dressing well? Not in clothing necessarily. Okay. Um, we grew up very blue collar. Yeah. Um, and I remember, maybe this is my affinity for having clothing now. Uh, I remember that when I was younger, I w we would go get like, you know, shoes at. What was it Sports Mart or yeah. whatever back in the yeah. day? And we'd go get shoes, and I would buy, it would be buy one, get one 50 off, and I'd buy two pairs of shoes. And right. by the time, like, I'd, I'd worn them out through, like, 
that my toes were hanging out of the shoes. Wow, yeah. Okay. So we grew up very blue collar. Yeah. Um, maybe that's my problem now is that like I like nice clothes a little too much. <laughs> but it was not never really uh the clothing side wasn't re- necessarily a passion of mine. I always drew, I sketched a lot okay. and I just I loved to draw. It was just kind of innate. Um but I wouldn't say necessary clothing, but I did like to like draw and I was definitely more creative than uh, say like my wife was not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And and how sure of you going into law school that this is what you wanted to do? Um, it, it didn't really happen until after law school. I mean, I had this conversation with a couple people yeah. during law school, um, and it wasn't something I really took seriously. Uh, that's it, when I was in law school is when I had my, my first custom suit made. Okay. Um, so I And then I had a couple made. So I had a couple made here, and then I had a couple made overseas. Okay. And the difference in quality was kind of staggering to me. Was it higher quality here? No. Higher it was quality there. Higher, higher quality Interesting. there. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what got the ball rolling and thinking, hey, I maybe maybe there's something about bringing this product here. Um, without going into too many specifics, I guess, the majority of custom suiting in the U.S. is very much the same. Okay. So probably out of all the custom clothiers, 70% use the same three manufacturers. Oh, okay. So at the end of the day, it's really the same product. It's just a different label on the on the garment itself. Um, where we're a little bit different is it's my own, um, it's my own team, mm. and we hand assemble everything. So we're able to do, like, we're able to keep our quality at a standard that really no one else can hit. Yeah, could yeah. you count on one hand how many how many other tailors make truly make it by hand? Um in this city, uh in Chicago, probably maybe one. Wow. Other one? Maybe. Okay. We got something special here. Then. Maybe. Um but when we say like when we do it bespoke it means if someone wants a true English looking jacket, it's gonna look like, you know, you walked off the street in Savile Row as yeah. opposed to there's what happens with most um, Asian made garments is it just kind of doesn't have a proper silhouette because okay. it's not really made by a designer so it kind of looks just looks like it's made in China oh no way okay. um, even though it might have a cool fabric or lining or whatever yeah. but it doesn't look Italian doesn't look British it kind of just looks like mm. blah Okay. Yeah. But for the average Joe, like, could they not, could they tell? You think they The tell? average person probably can't tell. Okay. Um, but for us, it's it's a pretty it's easy. It's interesting. Like, once you can tell, tell, you can't go back. Yes. <laughs> it's an expensive <laughs> habit. It's an expensive habit. Um, and so the first time you had a, a garment made for you in law school, what was the feeling that took over you when you first put it on? I think it's... Um, it's a psychological effect of, it's a confidence boost, right? Okay. You want to, uh, and this is something that we preach with a lot of our, um, not just our, our, our executives, but especially on our athlete side. So we, we do work with a lot of mm-hmm. professional athletes and celebrities, but we're all about selling them, not selling them, but they're about that grammatically incorrect, look good, mm-hmm. uh, play good, or feel good, play good kind of okay. deal, even though grammatically that is very wrong. <laughs> but uh, but it sounds good. I mean... Yeah, um, it rolls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it rolls. But, I mean, it, it kind of, like, once you, when you put on a shield of armor and you feel, like, indestruct- indestructible, you right. feel like Superman in it, I mean, it makes it makes you perform better. And what qualities of that suit do you think add to that is it the uniqueness to their style is it are are some people just worried about form over function or is there everyone has a different right so it's truly unique to them everyone is yeah so that's the beauty of custom clothing is you get to create something that fits you okay Uh, i mean we have guys who just get gray or navy suits because Mm. they have to go to court but Mm. to have something that fits perfectly they're going to feel great about that Mm. Uh, on the other hand we have guys who want to wear a bright red suit i mean if that's your style like you get to showcase it and and at the same time we make sure it fits perfect right 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 um can we let's talk about the the training you said so you've traveled to yeah over almost 200 manufacturers yeah yeah manufacturers um I mean, what if you were in the in the shoes of someone that couldn't afford to travel and just research like that? Yeah. 
how, how did yeah. you can't get to you can't research those places mm. um so for a lot of these factories unless you go see it if you just go online and try to find someone yeah you might find a, f- a handful okay maybe a dozen um but then you might find a bunch of agents who are not actually the manufacturer. Okay. You might find these people who represent themselves as a manufacturer, but they're not the manufacturer. Okay. There's a lot of, just because it's on the internet doesn't make it true. Right. <laughs> I right. mean, right. Yeah. and you it's need more cer- skepticism there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's certainly true in other parts of the world. Okay. Um, so just because of the internet doesn't mean it's true. I'm a firm believer uh, if you're involved in any uh, line of work that involves a manufacturing process that you have to kind of go see it for yourself. Okay. I mean, I don't believe it. I mean, I've seen people that advertise everything, uh, and then you, you go see it and it's, it's five, six person shop. And you're just right. like, this isn't, you know, or, right. or they're not even the shop. Like, right. Like I would, I would say on Alibaba or something like that, yeah. 60, 70% of those people are not the actual manufacturer. Mm. Yeah. So if they're taking a 30% cut on top of everything, plus you don't know where it's getting made, that's worrisome. Okay. Yeah. And going into those situations, what criteria were you looking for, spe- like if you had any specifically? The first, first few I went to, I had no idea what I was looking at. Okay. Um, luckily, uh, because of my mother's business, I had visited some manufacturing plants on her side of things, and she special, specializes in car radiators. Yeah, okay. So very, very different. Yeah. But... Um, manufacturing is a similar process. So when you go into a plant, you can kind of see how well operationally something is run. Okay. Um, you can kind of see how the, how everyone is treated. Um, so I, I got a general sense of, you know, a big picture. Yeah. Now it's, now it's, I mean, we can go in, I can spend probably five minutes and figure out tell. if they're going to be a fit for us or not. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And so were you also looking at like, where to source and things like yeah. that? Is that part of the main? Mm-hmm. Fa- okay. Mm-hmm. So everything like everything we get or everything that we have here, I've pretty much seen. So that's whether that's from um, from you our the hand filter, from yeah. the from our hand assembling process right. to pattern cutting and design and all that stuff. That's one side of it. And then the other side is all the fabric and where all that, that comes from in Italy and England. So I've been to all of our mills. Um, they sometimes the big names in fabric, like for example, Loro Piana and Scabal, and mm. they use a lot of other separate smaller mills. Okay. Um, so again, for them, it's also an, a name, but I've been to a lot of the mills just to see in England and Italy and see the difference and, and why the quality of fabric from Italy and England are better than say Asian fabrics. Interesting. Um, and it's really like, it's the craziest thing. Uh, and it's not just because they've been doing it that way for 200 300 years um which is part of part of the secret sauce but the secret sauce is the water in fabric which is seriously really yeah yeah (laughs) it's crazy um it's the it's the water it's like uh it has the it has a different mix of minerals and things like that that you can't uh Replicate. replicate right oh even though the source fabric source materials sometimes all they all typically come from New Zealand or okay. also, typically New Zealand wools I mean sometimes you'll get some from Scotland and okay. that that part but typically it comes from New Zealand um, and but it's the water it's just something you can't replicate is someone someone t- like something someone told you or how, how you can you... you can feel it like the water feels oh different okay. yeah um, so that's kind of what creates different kind of fabric uh, an easier analogy is for example why American beef is so good than just like the meat quality but one step for when we take it into textiles why American leather is considered like very durable mm. um, but then you get into like French le- and Italian leather and it's very soft and it's very supple wow. and but Asian leather is not very good okay and the reason for all of this is what they eat what the cows eat so in america you have gr- great like grass and right, like right, right. in asia the grass is brittle um so when they when the cows eat the grass it pokes a lot of like small holes in their hide so that's why that like it's just it's just not as soft and it's not as supple of a hide no and way. in western europe typically the grass is a little bit finer so that way it causes 
it, it, like in the end product, the, the leather is softer. That is crazy. Yeah. So it it all comes down to like there's a base trickles. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but there's a secret sauce, and I mean, this is something that I'm always interested in, yeah. in learning yeah. and kind of like passing on to our clients. Okay. Or the people that want to actually hear me talk about it. But there's there's a reason why nice things cost a certain amount of money and there's mm-hmm. a, like leather is something like when i say th- this about leather people are like oh that makes that makes sense they're not all the same it's not all the same um there's certain things you just can't replicate right yeah. right um you apprenticed right did you apprentice overseas oh, no you didn't apprentice. i i did but like a brief brief period oh, so okay, i wouldn't okay. be i'm not gonna say i'm gonna go so so, so you, something would you consider yourself self-made then or uh we are self-funded Self-funded. Yes. But what about your, like, when you, because you said that you uh, you started in your apartment. Right? Yeah. So, like, in that phase, yeah. how did you learn to, to make your own, you know? Make your it own was, space? in the beginning, it was a similar product to everyone else. So, okay. it was, like, finding people, finding, like, a manufacturer that other people had used online. Okay. Um, we went through a rebrand, complete rebrand, about four and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And we said, we're just going to to create the product we're creating right now okay so that's kind of when we did that big rebrand uh okay. when it started it was similar to everyone else it was it was a similar similar product but learning like stitching and all that like where yeah. did the, where did that come from uh thirst for knowledge i guess Oof. as over over time i mean we're continually still trying to get better um there are always things that like there are always things we can do to to improve our product right. uh to whether that's adding this fabric or that fabric or creating a new silhouette that fits our clients better okay. or, or different body style. And, and, and I mean, there's always something we can do that's better. Um, and how was balancing, you were a, a real estate attorney. Yeah. How was balancing that full-time gig versus running a shop out of your... Um, it was, so the real reason why for the full pivot was that everything, it, it was kind of suffering on both sides. Oh, okay. So in terms Can't of- Can't half-ass do things. Yeah, right? yeah. Okay. Um, so I was kind of not spending the amount of time I should be devoting to my business. I was mm-hmm. not spending the full time that I should have been working on my law career. It was kind of just a little bit sloppy on both ends. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it got to the point where I said, you have to do one or the other if you really want to be good at it. Right. And you obviously like you had it, but like how was how hard of that of, of a decision was that to choose <sighs> to choose one over the other? I don't. It's so hard to think about it now because at the time it was just like, or I guess another way, it's is, a passion project. Yeah. Do you miss it? Do you miss being? I don't miss being oh. a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't miss being a lawyer. Uh, I am still a licensed attorney. Okay. You probably don't want to hire me for anything. <laughs> I will go on record and say, and say that, um, but I I don't really miss it. This is, but starting your own business is every bit as much time and energy, mm-hmm. if not much much more. Um, but it's it's rewarding. It, um, I also this purely started as a passion project. Yeah, I love of, that. Of hey. Um, get some suits made for myself, start making some for my friends. And then it kind of just snowballed from that. I don't really even know what, how it and, really happened. But how is that process? Like, would they pick something off the rack and you would tailor it or how did, how did that work? No, it would be like, we, we have a set fabric for them. So and, you still, you started actually trying to go straight up bespoke from the beginning. Uh, more made to measure. Made to measure. Yeah. Okay. yeah like okay. Custom. custom or, Custom is the big umbrella, but yeah, but made to measure. So okay. Yeah. So, and can you break down the difference between made to measure and, and bespoke? Yeah. Um, they're a little bit interchanged a lot. A lot of people yeah. try to use bespoke for everything and bespoke can mean certain bespoke means made for you. And then there's the Italian term su misura, which mm-hmm. means made for you, but also means made to measure. So <laughs> there's a lot of huge differences. There's entry entry level made to measure, which means they already have something made for you. They're just going to lengthen the sleeves and oh. hem the pants, like lengthen or shorten the sleeves and hem okay. the pants. That's like classical made to measure in the in in layman's terms. Sure. Um, in my eyes, what bespoke really means is that they cut a pattern for you from scratch mm. or instead of cutting a pattern from you for you from scratch if we have a house pattern that is really good that we think 
will work for your build, we're going to use that pattern. Mm. We, I don't think you want to mess with something because we've designed these patterns to, for example, if you want a Neapolitan looking jacket, you're not going to, we don't want to mess with it too much. Mm-hmm. Um, with that said, like we'll cut it from scratch for your pattern. Mm. Um, and, and then some people try to say the sp- bespoke means you have to have that basted process of having like a half finished suit come in and then we tweak it everything tweak everything there and then we make it again um i'm not 100 percent sold that that's what the true meaning of bespoke is okay um because i like to think if you don't need to spend three months to four months to get a suit made and you can get it done in four Snap. weeks yeah. and we can get it right without that process isn't that what everyone wants hmm. yeah I mean, some guys, yeah, like we can do that. We can do the basic process and you come in here and like we give you, it's a half finished garment and then we pin everything and we we make it. But at the end of the day, the product difference, if we do our job right the first time, is negligible, is very, very negligible if, if there is any difference at all. So we like to say, hey, instead of our suiting starts at $2,500. Okay. Um, which is which is a pretty high number as it is, um, it's it's handmade and it's bespoke and all that, and, and we guarantee delivery in four weeks. Hmm. So, if we were to do that basic process, yeah, we can do it. But do you want to lengthen that timeline from four to at least twelve, twelve to sixteen weeks, and then also the price jumps from twenty five hundred to five thousand, right? If not more, yeah. If not more, yeah. Is that really something that? You know, some guys love that. Um, for me, I don't think... It's like you squeeze as much juice as you, you can yeah. out of that process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so walk me through the process. If someone were to come and, you know, be interested in, in a fitting or in a suit, yeah. um, how did that How did that consultation work out? How does it, how does it go? We, how have, we, uh, we have our guys book an appointment online. Okay. Uh, we say, guys, we are in beta for women. So we are we're testing it out. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, just because no one does it, and and people who do it right now do a very very poor job. Interesting. Of it, of okay. It. Uh, women's clothing can be very difficult. Very difficult. So that's why we're testing. Okay. Testing it. Um, it's is it? Would you consider it a whole nother skill set then? Yes. Okay. It's a whole nother skill set, not necessarily on our end in terms of designing, or or, or measuring and and all that. It's a whole different design skill set on the on the making process, on the manufacturing process. Oh. You can't have a men's tailor make a women's garment. Okay. Because, for example, on men's clothing, all the lines are straight. On women's clothing, lines are curved. Okay. It's it's very different. Right, to, right. It's very different asking someone to sew in a straight line and then sew, like, in a good curved line. Mm, okay. Very, very different. Okay. Yeah. Um, but anyways, we book, we book online. Yeah. Um, and then we set up a about an hour appointment. Whether okay. we either set up a 30, 30 minute style consultation if it's for someone's first time when they're on kind of on the fence mm-hmm. when they're ready, we'll book an hour appointment, and then that's kind of when we'll go through everything. We will will uh, go through picking out fabric, designing everything, taking all your measurements, et cetera. And like I guess what they're looking for, what season they're going to wear it mm-hmm. in. Um, we try to shut up during that period uh we want we want to we want to absorb as much as what someone can tell us but what and i'm sure you have like what if they don't know though right well like what if the, this is their first time with, yeah, yeah. with a custom yeah, yeah. service we'll help lead them yeah. a little bit um but we do uh we do this a ton for weddings i mean okay uh, and that's uh, that's actually the to me that's the most rewarding part of the job is okay. because when guys are seeking us out for their momentous day it, right it's it's pretty rewarding to be like, why, hey, we can we can help out. Why with shouldn't that. a suit cost as much as a dress? <laughs> it shouldn't cost. I hope no, it like, doesn't no, cost. I'm just saying it's yeah, like, yeah. if the dress is this much, right. why, why you, you know you shouldn't look sloppy. <laughs> uh, we see that that I, that's actually for some of our clients who have come to us after their weddings and who have rented or, or had something um, not that great for their weddings. Right. That's kind of been their biggest regret and saying like, oh. hey, I, I wish I had something nicer for my wedding. Okay. So. For those that are listening, they're getting married. It doesn't have to be us. Yeah, Just yeah, yeah. Go get something nice it's for your a, wedding. It's a big yeah, deal. yeah, yeah. Um, if and assembling your 
your team, I, and I know you're not just, you know, for, for suits, but you're trying to cultivate an experience for the clients mm-hmm. when they walk through your, through your doors. So what, what other experiences be, besides your undivided attention to them are you, are, is someone going to get an ESQ? Um, we, we're going to try to provide the best customer service, obviously, but the whole concept behind our space yeah. to some to some degree is kind of like a man cave idea. Cool. Or having you walking in and be like, man, this is what I want my closet to look like. Okay. What that means is there's going to be some fun toys in here as well, especially at our new space. I don't want to re- sure, uh, sure, say sure. it all, but yeah. like we have a PlayStation hooked up. So oh, if dope. you want to like just come in and hang out, yeah. um, we'll, we do have a full bar set up, oh. um, which but we do not charge for it, so obviously there's nothing. Um, there's not like a club or anything like that. But it's and but at the end of the day, we still want to focus on what we're good at. Um, and our job, per se, is not is not per se um, hospitality. But at the same time, we want you to feel at home. We want you to feel, in terms of your clothing and everything, we want you to right. be feel like you're a part of this family. Yeah. Um, and we treat all of our clients the same whether they're you know an a-list celebrity to right to, to a 18 year old right, so um uh, the ones i i'm aware of like celebrities you've worked with um charles tillman peanut and yeah. then most notably like recently like mitch trubisky yeah yeah matt forte a lot of athletes yeah um we've been fortunate uh in the entertainment world to work with a few guys notable guys there as well um we've dressed chance multiple yes multiple that's times. an awesome jacket yeah um, we work with thomas rett okay um, we have a pretty we have a fairly large west coast following for being oh, cool. based here uh at least in hollywood like we dressed we dressed a bunch of people for the red carpet premiere of crazy rich asians Dope. um now, does that have anything to do with you being Asian? Somewhat, really? Yeah, That's I think so it cool. was. It, I think it's some. <laughs> I think it's some. A little bit of matter of pride at, right, that, right. at that point. Yeah. Um. So. Did yeah. you spend any time out there, or like, how did they get word? Um. I met Jimmy O Yang, who's a comedian. Okay. Um. Through my sister originally, because okay. she she works out in L.A. Okay. Uh, she's in the entertainment industry. And I met Jimmy. He's still hilarious. Um, Jimmy, I'm giving you a plug. His, <laughs> if you're Asian, you're listening. You don't have to be Asian, but he has a book called How to American. Okay. Um, get the audio book version. Okay. Uh, He's good with it because he narrates. Okay. Okay. It. And it's it's How to American, like an immigrant's guide on how to disappoint your parents. All right, I'll check. And it he's out. a comedian. It's hysterical. Uh, and Jimmy's become a really good friend. And Jimmy, Jimmy introduced. He's in the movie. He introduced okay. me some guys, but yeah, he's hysterical. I, I'm a bad Asian. I still haven't seen it. <laughs> it's. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a, it's Yellow Panther. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, for me, it's kind of a, it was kind of a no-brainer. So do you do you still get starstruck then after working around these big names? Not really. Right, you just you just treat them like another person. Not really. I mean, our clients. It's like you wouldn't you wouldn't give just because they're an athlete or a celebrity. You wouldn't give them extra attention than you would an no. attorney or someone else. Who... No, I mean we have we have many clients that we have clients that could buy the movie. You know, so it's and it's, they just aren't famous. That's all. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of we treat every we try to treat everyone the same. We have a lot of clientele that are every bit as wealthy or. Uh, well off as okay. as these people, okay. um, if not more so, yeah. Um, and with assembling your team, mm-hmm. um, how is that process like? What what qualities were you looking for when assembling your team? It's ongoing. Uh, we are hiring, so if again, oh, if you're for, what, yeah. what, what positions? We're <laughs> we're hiring. We're hiring. Uh, like we call them professional clothiers. Okay. Um, it's essentially it's a sales. A driven position sure um but it's for us to kind of grow out, grow out our team because we don't advertise it's all really a, a networking word of mouth word of mouth kind of thing yeah um we are at f- we're four people strong currently yeah uh it's myself and then my general manager his name is jordan he came on four and a half years ago when we started doing the rebrand when we came into this space okay uh that's when he came on he kind of oversees everything everything day to day he wears a Wears a lot of hats, and then we have um, we have a person who's in charge of sales, and then we have a person in charge of business development. Yeah, yeah. And is it currently 
busting at the seams like you're you're like absolutely ready or you it's a, it's a necessity to to expand i think so i mean i we're at the point where like hey we have a great product mm-hmm. uh we're not super well known i guess we don't again we don't do a ton of advertising yeah. etc so we're not really that well known um but we have a great product and we have a great offering um and i think now it's kind of time to let it be known mm. yeah. and so and all of my previous guests have shared that word of mouth has been like their bread and butter mm-hmm. is, is by having a good product or service it, it lets it speak for itself yeah and that your clients will speak for you yeah i mean our clients being our strongest advocate is we couldn't ask for anything better than that yeah and so you were absolutely like you felt ready for the moment that like i guess i want to identify like what that tipping point was when you were ready to expand let's say from your apartment or let's say from now to the next location like what do you think was that tipping point the apartment thing was kind of we were kind of forced to do it a little bit okay um it was going okay uh my my wife now girlfriend at the time i mean she, it wow, was, she's uh, been along for the whole she's ride. been along That's for amazing. everything yeah yeah <laughs> um and she would have to i just i remember she would like go hide in the bedroom or put the take the oh, dogs okay. in the bedroom and she'd go hide when we had people over when i had people over because right. it was a part of the room right, right. um that was not ideal um at the same time because it was a residential building yeah like other people probably weren't that thrilled with it with, with me having clients coming over it's but it's not like an airbnb it's like you were there you yeah know. but st- but still yeah. um it kind of got to the point where we were just it was just a little bit too much traffic okay so we decided to and it, it, that coincided with the fact that uh my mom kept on just me like that shirt doesn't look right or that suit doesn't look right and i was like what are you talking about this and, and but now looking back i'm like yeah on didn't. you or yeah on like on, on me okay and that's kind of when we every time was like okay something's up so we kind of went through a rebrand as well so okay. um so we all, we were building out this space at, on Jackson, and we kind of went through the rebrand at the same time and oh, locking okay. down our new manufacturing and all, all of that. So, um, And then once that was ready, that's when we kind of launched new and improved ESQ. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I read somewhere that it was also what inspired you was um, your your dad's lack of sense of fashion, which I resonate with because my, my dad will have, like, f- like just – flooded pants yeah, and yeah. like all like no like nothing's matching and yeah. like maybe that kind of works in his favor but like i'm like damn what really um, he doesn't care like, yeah <laughs> i don't i don't think it's a matter of doesn't care i think especially as a lawyer in like the 90s and 2000s you just wear whatever is comfortable because you're in a suit every single day yeah. and you go to court and everyone right. else kind of looks the same and it's unfortunate if you go to a city hall now you see a lot of guys still look like that Oh, okay. Um, it's just kind of, it's it's your work uniform, I guess. Yeah. Um, kind of wearing your personality out, out on your sleeve. Right? Yeah, it's, way, yeah. Luckily, I think a lot of the younger generation, um, by younger, I mean, I'm even throwing millennials in there, mm-hmm. care a little bit more about their personal style. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think people just tend to care a little bit more now. Mm-hmm. So you'll, you've kind of seen a resurgence of fashion. I love it. Yeah. Um, and now I just want to pick your brain on, on, let's say the next generation or the communities that don't necessarily can't afford this type Mm -hmm. of stuff. Mm -hmm. But what you said earlier is, you know, you look good, you feel good and you play good, you perform Mm -hmm. well. Um, and so something like, like this would do so much for a community that is so down, I guess. We are, we're still trying to lock down some events this year. Um, whether that be, it depends on what organization we're tr- we're going to finally partner with, but yeah. working on how to do a, like a suit drive, especially with, um, yeah, like whether, uh, whether it be geared towards, um, like, f- uh, uh, veterans. Right. Or, or people that are homeless who need something for interviews okay. and stuff like that. Um, 
if there are any organizations listening and they want to help help us out, we will match will match a suit for every suit someone else donates. Right. Um, we've been uh, we're, we're trying to work. We might we're trying to partner with uh, either the mayor's office or something like this, or oh. with the bears actually. Um. So I. Mitch is like the middle person of all this. So Mitch um, partnered with My Block, My Hood, My City, Mm -hmm. um, the organization run by Jamal Cole, who his current, he just made a book called It's Not Regular and things like ordering food behind a bulletproof glass is not regular. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he tries to provide opportunities for his community to go out onto Michigan Avenue and explore different career paths and whatnot. So I guess not necessarily a suit drive, providing an opportunity to educate how to be a tailor, how to sew garments and, and things like that. That's like a totally like on That's the side a, project. Yeah, yeah. But wouldn't that, that be, I think that'd be that, very interesting. Yeah, it's... Um, Another skill set. This is a skill set that is very lost on us. Yes. Um, which is, I guess, okay. Uh, maybe tailoring is not... Tailoring in the U.S. is not... Uh, it, like the people that aren't teaching it aren't that great anymore. Okay. I think it's... it's um. It's excelling in so many other parts of the world okay. that I would tell younger kids to look at something else, to be honest. Interesting. Um, but, I mean, don't you think then there's it, there's a void to fill, though? There is. But in terms of, a, I don't mean tailoring as a in general, but I mean especially specifically when it comes to, like, suiting. Okay. There's a lot of things that go into making a suit that, uh, for example, if you want to create a good suit Mm -hmm. you probably have to invest about three hundred thousand dollars in equipment alone so it's like when you make shoulders it's not just like you sew the shoulders on you have to actually set the shape and there's a steamer like a really high powered steamer that you need but not just for the shoulder for the chest piece and like like everything else so there's there's actually a substantial substantial cost involved with making that's suiting that's interesting yeah yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing it's not just like one guy in his back in the back office kind of just making it Nowadays, and so, do you think it can be? And it, this is very contextual, but like it can be very rewarding to just kind of apprentice, but eventually not just apprentice, um, but like let's say work under someone, then like yeah. work under Gawain, yeah, yeah, yeah. ESQ. You know, we're always taking interns. <laughs> like even if <laughs> yeah. someone, I just like I wonder how many people like want to create that name for themselves, but I've also come across a lot of people that have cultivated such a good team dynamic and work culture that that someone might not necessarily feel the need to make their own name because they feel so at home where they're at i'm i never really wanted to make my own name okay. i tried to stay out of the spotlight actually. okay um this is hence why this is the reason it's called esq and not Gus custom suits <laughs> I mean, there's nothing wrong. Get, um, there's nothing wrong with that. I okay. mean, just a lot of guys, you know, you want your name on on the product, right? Yeah. And obviously, everyone wants to be like a Tom Ford or something like that. But Tom Ford is a great designer. I mean, guys who do custom suits. No offense, guys, you're not a designer. Like, mm. um, I remember when Kanye Kanye went out and said like that they discriminate against him because he's not a designer. You're not. Like, you're not. I mean, other people go to fashion school and spend years, like, perfecting their craft. You're not. You're right. a businessman. Right. That's kind of what I say. I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, it's called ESQ. Uh, part of that is I don't really want to be in the spotlight, but also that's I, I want to give credit where credit is due, and that's mm. the rest of my team. Mm. I think that. Um, where did ESQ come from? Is it how much of it was Esquire? How much? How much it's, of it? It's Esquire. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's it, it was. I mean, it just kind of when I was thinking of names, it kind of just came out. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it, just because I it, no, it rolls. Yeah, um, and it's like, and I actually didn't know this. Like the three letters behind an attorney's yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Um, There's an archaic yeah definition. Yeah, please share. I, archaic, <laughs> archaic English definition, which means just like a nobleman or a gentleman. I so, dig that. Yeah, this yeah. is seventeen hundreds, but yeah. What's that movie with with the uh, where they suit up? Kingsman. I love Kingsman. that movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. First one was great. Second one, not. I haven't seen it. Yeah, first one was great. Um, have you seen the John Wicks? I have. <laughs> Has anyone come in here looking for like bulletproof suits? <laughs> no, no, I don't. Not yet. Is that a thing though? Is that or is that all fiction? <sighs> 
there's yeah that's all fiction oh, okay. there's no way you can put kev you can sew kevlar <laughs> into a suit and also like the entire <laughs> chest is exposed i mean there's yeah, yeah, yeah. and kev kevlar that? vests are are heavy yeah. uh we actually have we have had um we've had defense contractors who've mm. needed things we've had um guys to high like conceal yeah conceal? we've okay. we've had guys actually um we've we've had someone on on the president's security detail Whoa. um who's a client and that was that was a challenge because we had to create something really the biggest challenge for that suit was creating something that was ultra functional, functional. yes so it couldn't we wanted to fit as slim as possible but but still allowing much more movement than a necess- than a regular suit that, yeah. um, and at the same time we probably hit we probably put seven or eight extra pockets into the jacket oh. and into the trousers for example we had to reinforce the waistband three times through yeah because, to carry all that because on their belt they're carrying everything wow. um yeah it's just i mean that's kind of when we saw the whole kevlar thing like kevlar vests are are, are, are thick and they're they're bulky. There's no way you could build that into a suit. Interesting. Very cool concept. It's n- yeah, not, really. <laughs> not 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 going to happen in reality. So how how techy do can can the suit get? You see some things nowadays where, I mean, you see these like Facebook or Instagram ads of the Lululemon of suits, and in my eyes, are you, yeah, if you work a tech job in San Francisco, you can sure mm. by all means if you're you'll be comfortable and (laughs) but if you're going to an actual board meeting or if you're actually going to court or something like that you'll get laughed they'll get laughed at because it doesn't look like a suit it looks nothing like a suit interesting you can't it's not supposed to fit like sweatpants or look like sweatpants right you know not not only is that different it's just the fabric is when we get into technical fabrics technical fabrics are 99 percent of technical fabrics are polyester Hmm. polyester is just fancy for plastic recycled plastic right um so we we don't use anything polyester okay um the closest we've gotten it's not even close but like we've actually made our own uh this new shirting we have which Mm -hmm. is awesome it's bamboo yeah um and the bamboo is beautiful because it's ultra silky it's uh odor resistant it's wrinkle resistant yeah and but every application of bamboo in the past is it's either really stiff because it has no give at all okay or it has a ton of stretch it's made for bed sheet like you see bed sheets and those things made out of bamboo they're really really comfortable and they're great um it's great with heat but you couldn't use it for dress clothing because it's either too stretchy or not stretchy at all and like not comfortable so we actually i actually made our own proprietary fabric with just a little bit of stretch um, we only have it in white and blue right now, but it is the greatest shirt you'll ever put on. Is that we, what you're wearing it right now? I'm, I'm not actually wearing oh, okay, it right okay. now. Um, but it is the greatest shirt um, we've, we've made to date. And uh, it's it's just, that's something like that I'm really proud of that yeah. we can say, like, only we have this. Like, yes. Because I went and sourced this. Other people don't have the ability to do that. Yeah. And so I, I keep thinking about this tipping point thing and like when you work with clients like like mitch um the white house detail is there any part of you that is like man we're gonna explode with orders soon like they're gonna tell their buddies and like they're all gonna come flooding in and i don't have the team to handle this (laughs) anything like that i don't i don't have that i think i'm a realist at this point okay i think throughout the process of building this business I've had that thought many times. I mean, like, yeah. hey, if we like, we got published in this magazine, right, we're gonna blow right. up. No, like, at the end of the day, and I realize this, our product isn't for everyone. Okay, um, it's kind of a unique niche product, and what really is going to continue, like, what really is gonna prolong success for us in the long run is just it's gonna be hard work. It's gonna be a lot of hard work, mm-hmm. and it's gonna be adding the right people to our team. Um, there's not, for us, it's not like a, it would, there's never going to be anything that's going to be overnight, I, I, yeah. don't, I don't think. Right. Yeah, as much as I would love for that no, to be the in case. In any industry, that that's just not how it works. 
Sometimes, I mean, when something... But it's it's like, it's luck then out of that. You means. see it a lot. Or it's like... You see it in like the tech industry and you see just like all of these overnight successes. But I think it really isn't going to happen in our industry. And you, you might, like you might be t- selling a t-shirt on Instagram and some celebrity wears it. And mm-hmm. then all of a sudden everyone buys it because it's $40. You know, it's it's much more accessible. But for us, I don't know. Yeah, this is different. Okay. Yeah, it's just just a different animal. Um, and so with your relocation, yeah. um, rebranding and a little like a kind of a small pivot, um, what are some objectives and goals you're trying to reach for 2020? Um, we want to grow our team. Okay. That's kind of my, my biggest goal. Yeah. And we want to bring on the right people. And that's kind of our, it's always been a challenge, but I think um, we just brought on, I just brought on um, someone to run our business development. And I hope, I think she's going to do a really good great job there um for us it's growing out the team and then continuing to build the brand and our presence yeah and so when you're when you're interviewing someone what's your ratio of technical skills versus soft skills are you are you looking at there are a lot of intangibles because we talked about like hospitality right hospitality yeah. and all there are that. a lot of intangibles in terms of what we're looking for it's not necessarily um saying hey you need to know every technical detail we can teach you all of that right Um, it's about how are you with other people? Mm. Uh, that's a skill that I wish I picked up earlier in life. Okay. Um, I was always pretty shy and I didn't really, really develop the skill until college and law, specifically law school. It was kind of one of those things where in law school, they use the Socratic method, which is pretty archaic everywhere else where, um, a professor will just go to class. He'll pull up a sheet. And they'll just call on you. And you'll just go about a case for maybe 30, 40 minutes. Wait, like call you out? Yeah. Like you'll, like you'll have a, you know, you'll have a hundred people in the class and he'll be like, say, Mr. Wang. And then tell me about this case. And then he'll just grill you for like 30, 30 minutes. Yeah. And whether you better be, so like it forces you to be prepared if you if you if you're not prepared, I mean it it'll show right away. So it's, is it not even worth showing up to class then? <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where it, it makes you you're just like you know what I got to do it anyways. Everyone's got to do it, and it just makes take kind of takes took me out of the, my shell a little bit and saying yeah. like, what's I mean, other people have done much better than me getting called on. Yeah, I, so- other people have done much worse so it's it's it is what it is i was gonna ask if if being an attorney kind of led to this like helped you be a good entrepreneur it's a great skill set to have uh but it's also a very expensive skill (laughs) set so if you could do it all over again would you like forego i don't i don't know um i don't know I've, i've law school was something unique for me i think it was i think it's been great for me personally but Again, it was it's a very expensive yeah. skill set. And now, current day, um, how do your parents feel about about the business life, about the entrepreneur? They life? are, they're still many times over more successful than I am. So, oh, um, it's but our, I think it's generational the definition of success. Yes, yes and no, um, <laughs> yes and no. So I we. My wife and I, we just had our first baby, and he's a, he's 10 months old now. Okay, congrats. It changes, like, everything in terms of outlook. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, success now aligns much closer to what my parents would view as success. It's kind of like, how can I provide a means for the best life possible for my child? Agreed. And I I realized that after my initial thought of their idea of success for me was medicine engineering or you know all that um but the bedrock underneath that layer was do something that allows you to provide for yourself and your family your family when it's just you like that's one side that's something I, i don't know it's something something some trigger switched or something right yeah. yeah it's not just you anymore no yeah oh and it's different like f- even from being married to, <laughs> to yes yeah 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 <laughs> marriage didn't change really anything i mean we've been together nine years so okay yeah marriage we only got married two years ago so marriage didn't change anything for us okay um is there anything any advice you would give to up-and-coming tailors 
aspiring tailors like tailors as in i guess because you don't even call i mean well, like, i don't call myself i know a tailor, like I'm, like right? yeah um so do you mean like a tailor if you're a tailor like go apprentice somewhere in europe yeah or new york yeah. at least certainly new york okay um from someone who's actually good uh in new york or go go to go to europe um but if you're talking from someone who's i call myself just an, an entrep- entrepreneur, entrepreneur right okay. um i think for an entrepreneur the most important takeaway is you have to learn how the sausage is made you don't have to make the sausage but you have to know everything that goes into it and every step so so you can properly delegate so you can properly delegate so you can see when something is wrong or something is not yes right like or how you can improve certain things okay like you have to understand every aspect of the business interesting it's kind of like when people open restaurants, I think. Like people, I always get this, that the only people who are successful ever opening a restaurant have worked in the restaurant industry. There's so much that goes into a restaurant. Yeah. You know, that like, it's not just, hey, I have an, I'm have i an investor. I'm going to put money in this. There's so much. You have to know. Like, and and it, even even if you've been a chef, but that's all you've done, yeah. when you try to open up your own restaurant, it, it's still very, very hard. Right. Um, we've, we had... Um, a gentleman called uh, his name's Jason Chan. Okay. Um, he actually his his next current concept. He's got a couple things going on. Is at um, the timeout market in West. Okay. Luke. Yeah, yeah. Um, he runs the stand uh, Sugar Cube, um, but he's had um, Katana and Juno. And okay. Like, yeah, yeah. And so, but he grew up in the industry, and he's done every role from front of house to the kitchen. And you have so, to exactly. That's you what he was to. saying. You have to. Um, doesn't mean you have to do that, but you have to understand it. And so doing in the op- entrepreneur world, are, are you thinking like some a- accounting, some hospitality? Like, yeah, okay. I think you want to know, you want to have a grasp of, in big picture, you should know everything that's going on. Um, I might not be day to day on everything, but I have an idea. I have a pretty good idea of everything that goes on. Right. Especially when you're starting out when you can't afford to delegate out. I, I um, Delegating was also was one of the toughest things I've had to do i've never because when i started for five years for for almost five years it was just myself here or Or no no, no, before that okay okay. before that it was just pretty much myself um and then it was but like just to keep my sanity i kind of had had to start doing it and that's but there are certain things where and, and this is also this is the gift and the curse of being an entrepreneur and having your own business is that no one is going to treat the business like it's your business because it's your business, right? So no one's going to put in the same amount of time, blood, sweat, and tears for you as as your baby. Agreed. And unless there's some kind of like, but see, it's it's still like it's ESQ. It's not Ga Wang in a it's way. It's ESQ. So uh, another driving force between behind my staff is Jordan, who's been with me for. Um, four and a half years now, almost five years, has a small piece of the pie now okay. because he deserves it. Yeah. He, he like he's worked very hard and he's and he's just, he's a great guy uh, and we've built such a great relationship and he kind of does everything. He treats it like it's his own. And if you're gonna do that, um, I want you to be a part of this. Well, that's really nice. Yeah. So that's not just him. Um, that's going to be our subsequent hires down the road too. If everything works out long term, we want you to be a part of it. I know I can't do this all by myself. Uh, that's that's a that's another big takeaway. Yeah. Um, a book I read a few years ago kind of really opened up my mind to and like kind of blew me away. Uh, it's called Shoe Dog. It's Phil Knight's autobiography. Okay. Oh, okay, bi- okay. Biography. Not autobiography. So about how he started Nike and how like nice. it's all about. For him, it's all about hiring and bringing on the right people to be a part of what you're doing and yeah. who believe in it. And if they're doing the right thing, like making them a part of it, there's no there's no shame in that. Like you have to, for any business, I think you have to understand that there's only there's only there's a limit to what one person can do. Yeah, yeah, agreed. 
all I had, Jordan. Or the Chicano. That's all I had. I called yeah. you Jordan. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> Wait, well, it's, uh, that's another another reason why it's called ESQ and not <laughs> God's custom suits. Um, yeah. So eventually, when we do have a team that, uh, not yeah, every because I I, I uh, read the about page and I'm like, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I know what he looks like. I'm, but obviously, you don't look like Jordan. <laughs> Jordan's Jordan's uh, arguably much more handsome than me. Stop, yeah. stop. No, you got a good-looking crew. Um, oh, well, thanks for coming on, guys. Yeah, thanks for having thanks me. for doing this. Um, we wish you the best of luck with the relocation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 180 North LaSalle. So, guys, check that out if you're looking for a truly custom suit that fits you. Um, and it's like you just you don't know any better if you've been going off the rack. Yeah. Right? I so mean, just, even at if least, you like, come yeah. up for a consult and yeah, just, yeah. like, yeah. Just immerse yourself in the experience, yeah. and um, but it's something that I I hope to strive for or achieve one day myself is to just be hugged by a customer. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think I I have one of those like made to measure suits. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does the job for now, but yeah, like, yeah, good. one day, one good. day. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, stay curious. Abla aloha. I'll see you in the next episode.